Excellent. Let us get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, really glad having you here. My name is Helen Adiosin. I'm the CEO and founder of CARE Academy. Uh, and welcome to CARE Academy's webinar, Views from the C-Suite, How We Lead Home Care Post-COVID-19. I am so excited uh, to be sharing lessons um, from Susan Brett, the CEO and Senior VP at People Care Inc., as well as David Rosales, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at VNSNY. Um, before we get into everything, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so Care Academy, we are the number one provider of online training designed for mobile, portable records uh, with 160 hours of training, an online dashboard, customer support in both English and Spanish, as well as an API integration. And the next slide. Um, if you haven't used Zoom webinar, and I can't imagine if 2020 would be complete if you haven't had access to Zoom or had to use Zoom meeting, but uh, if you haven't used Zoom webinars, the control panel is at the very bottom. Uh, this session is meant to be interactive. It's our last um, and, and certainly one of the, the, the ones that we've been waiting for uh, in terms of our C-suite sessions. Um, and we wanna keep it interactive. So we've got your questions and we want even more questions. Um, we want you to react as well as provide your insights and your thoughts as well. So we want you to, you know, just, just to be active. Um, and the very bottom bar, there are your audio set settings. So you have your chat, your raise hand feature and your Q and A. Uh, click on the Q and A to ask your questions. And um, we will, as best as we can, make sure that that is included as part of the conversation. Next slide. So start submitting your questions and responses below um, as any questions come up or you're thinking or have thoughts on responses. Um, this, we're, we're also certainly here to learn as well. Next slide. And so without further ado, um, I wanna welcome Susan Brett. It is uh, also, I think Susan would be a little embarrassed but it is also Susan's birthday today. So uh, hey, hey. wish her, <laughs> wish uh -huh. her Wish her happy birthday in the comments so we can say happy birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. <laughs> so Susan is the COO and Senior VP uh, at People Care Inc. Her bio, so Susan uh, Brett has over 32 years of experience in home health care. Uh, she joined People Care Inc. Uh, in 1990 and held various, uh, held various roles, including director, senior vice president, and hit the privacy officer. Since 2006, she served as People Care's chief operating officer, overseeing all operations of the company. Her expertise is in the areas of operations, strategic planning, home care advocacy, regulatory compliance, and business development and profitability. She's held a seat on the board of directors for the Home Care Association of New York uh, for, and, uh, for eight years to help shape the industry on a state level. Um, and she has also held roles as vice chair and secretary of the state board of the Home Care Association of New York State, and currently holds a position as the co-chair for the Down uh, State Licensed Home Care Forum and the New York State Home Care Association. So welcome, Susan, and happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Thanks for coordinating today. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Very glad to have you. Next slide. So, look, awesome, thank you so much. And so uh, our next guest is David Rosales, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at VNSNY. Um, so David is Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for the Visiting uh, Nurse Service of New York, uh, the nation's largest non-for-profit home and community-based healthcare organization. Appointed to his position in June 2018, Mr. Rosales oversees VNSNY strategic program development, performance and innovation, government programs management, and government grants functions. He applies his considerable experience in healthcare planning and strategy to the development and execution of initiatives designed to support and further the organization's mission-driven goals. Mr. Rosales holds a bachelor's of arts degree from Harvard College and a master's in a business administration degree from Harvard Business School. David, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Helen. Thanks for, thanks for having us and really looking forward to this discussion. Excellent, excellent. So before we get going, if we can have the next slide, 
Um, before we get going, we uh, typically just love to get a sense of your organizations. You both are coming from you know, pretty uh, large and sophisticated organizations who um, handle for a lot of, of function and, and thousands of lives um, throughout New York State. And so we'd love to just get a sense, starting from with you, Susan, of people care, you know, where the organization is, maybe where the organization was, you know, previous to COVID, um, just the who, what, where, when, and, and, and of people care. And then we'll do the, the same thing with you, um, David, as well. Sure, thank you. Okay, so just to give you a little background, uh, people care is actually one of the longest standing, if not the, the, the oldest in the New York metropolitan area, the oldest licensed uh, service agency um, in our area. We were licensed uh, in 1976 and uh, we've grown tremendously throughout the years. Um, we service approximately 6,500 lives a year. Um, we employ approximately 3,800 caregivers who are primarily uh, home health aides and certified uh, personal care aides. Um, we do do uh, have array of other services. We provide nursing and some of the therapy services, but our core business is primarily paraprofessional. Um, and we contract with a, a host of managed long-term care companies um, and certified home health agencies, uh, David's organization being one of them, uh, VNS of New York. Um, we're probably one of the first agencies, I believe, that, that contracted with David to provide home care services. That's right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we work with the managed care organizations um, and uh, we like to consider ourselves uh, innovative and on the front, kind of the forefront of uh, the industry. Um, our caregivers are members of 1199 um, SEIU, so they're part of the union. I think it's important to note um, because that's also helped us along the way. And um, I think that although we've grown over time and, and we've seen a huge evolution of changes throughout the years, um, just to note, I've been here at the company for 30 years. So I've certainly seen lots and lots of changes. Um, I think that over the past 10 months, we've uh, dealt with challenges um, clearly that we've never seen before. And I think in some ways, um, although it's been extremely stressful and, and difficult for so many, um, it's helped us position ourselves and kind of to look at future opportunities, to look at innovations and things like that, which we'll talk more about, I'm sure, as this um, presentation goes on. But that gives you a little background of our, our company. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susan. That was really helpful. And David, could you share about the Innocent One? Sure, sure. So the Visiting Nurse Service of New York was founded 127 years ago, I believe, um, by Lillian Wald. And uh, today we are a uh, home and community-based provider of care and also a health plan operating primarily in New York City and the sur surrounding suburban counties of New York. Our certified home uh, health agency has an active daily census of about uh, 8,500 to 9,000 patients a day. We have the largest hospice program in New York State, uh, which serves uh, about 1,500 uh, patients a day and their families. Um, we also employ uh, over 7,000 uh, uh, caregivers and personal care workers um, uh, through our licensed home care agency. And uh, as a managed care plan, we have a Medicaid managed long-term care uh, plan that provides uh, long-term supports and services to about 25,000 uh, New Yorkers. Um, we, uh, like, uh, like people care, um, being in New York, I think put us at the forefront of, uh, of, the, of the COVID pandemic, right? When, um, when COVID hit this country, it hit uh, New York very hard, very fast as everyone knows. And um, VNSNY was, uh, you know, played a very important role on the front lines in, in New York City, helping to decompress and decant our hospitals. Um, and, and to date, we have cared for nearly 3,000 COVID positive uh, patients in their homes. Wow, wow, that's a tremendous amount of impact. And so I know that folks are already sort of percolating and just, but this is great in that it helps us understand from both of your perspectives where your organization 
you know, uh, was pre previous to the pandemic and then also the scale and the enormity of the situation, um, just based on the fact that both your organizations are in New York. So let's get into some of the questions that um, folks proposed, um, you know, previous to coming into um, today's session. Um, so Cindy McKay asks, if there is one thing that you could suggest to a, a small home care company, knowing that you guys are coming from um, having a level of reach and enormity um, tactically to help better position themselves to ensure that they have the staff to support the need within their market, what would your suggestion be? And what I hear in that question is, what were and are the priorities for both your organizations in terms of ensuring that you have the frontline staff available? But maybe that's another way to kind of color that question. And how would you think about prioritizing um, your staffing? Let's say, yeah, Susan, you want to take it? Oh, sure. sure. Okay. Um, well, I think in, in some ways, small agencies may have some advantages over large agencies, but I'll, I'll share those thoughts with you. I think regardless of, of size right now and during COVID, um, I'm not sure what every agency went through. I could speak for our agency. I think when COVID hit, um, we had many patients that we service that were fearful of having home health aides and, and caregivers in their home, and therefore they refused services. We had uh, patients that were COVID positive, just like David, and so therefore we weren't servicing those patients. We had caregivers that were positive and fearful as well in the metropolitan area, they're traveling and so forth. We have administrative staff that were concerned about traveling. And um, I think that it was, a time to kind of reflect on, on how we ensure that we, we have the staff in place in the fields as well as in the office to ensure that we could continue with business continuity. Um, at our company, we were fortunate, we were able to, um, were, uh, I guess, be resilient and, and, and think about how we could be flexible with staff to ensure that they stayed on board. Um, we had some staff that were furloughed as a result of COVID due to you know, the decrease in business that we saw over the period of time, but we were able to shift to remote working um, conditions and our staff were set up so that they had laptops and phones, they could work remotely. And I think by providing them with flexibility, whether large or small staff feel that you're, you're pliable and you're nimble um, and you're supportive. Um, and I think that that made a very big difference in terms of the commitment of the staff that we had throughout this this time of COVID, um, we ensured that we had a really, really strong level of communication with our staff. We had daily leadership calls. Our leaders had daily calls with the staff that worked for us. Um, we provided a lot of support to our caregivers in the field because without them, you know, we don't exist. Um, we did COVID screening remote COVID screening with our staff. We created a hotline for both administrative staff as well as our field staff for questions or concerns they had throughout the pandemic. And I think you know that that made a big difference. So I think I think investing in education, communication, regardless of size, is critical. Um, and showing that, um, I think as even as a leader, kind of showing that vulnerability and that humility and compassion sets certain agencies apart from others. And I think that that worked for us throughout this time. That's awesome, Susan. And I, I really appreciate a lot of the, you know, the different pieces that came together. It wasn't only prioritization and utilization of staff for end recipients of care, but it's also thinking about, and, um, you know, Angel Conway asked a little bit of the questions about how do we think about caring for staff as well. David, do you want to take that question too? Um, how did you all think about prioritizing staff and, and, and sort of was, what was the communication and, and how did you uh, look at, you know, staffing um, at the height of COVID for you all? Yeah, a great question. So I think, you know, a couple of things. One is that um, I can't underestimate how quickly um, the staffing shortages hit us, right? Um, uh, especially, especially in New York. Um, we went from we went from you know having a full complement of staff to um, you know at some points 30 40 percent uh, reduction in our staffing capacity because people were quarantined they were sick um, they'd been exposed um, they 
they were scared. It, it was it was rapid, and so um, we had to we had to adapt quickly, and we had to uh, triage our, our patients and um, our staff in order to prioritize who could who needed to be seen um, when. I, I would say that um, the one of the biggest lessons we learned through the pandemic has been the communication, 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 that you cannot over communicate. And, um, and that includes both sharing of information, you know, keeping people up to date on what, on changes to PPE protocols, et cetera. But what was, what's been really interesting is that as, as important as the factual information is the human element. This has been a, a tremendously challenging year emotionally, right, for, for all of us. And so what we found was, was uh, supporting our staff with, um, we hold weekly emotional support calls um, with, with many of our, 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 our caregivers where the sole focus is to, is to talk about how, how, how they're doing, right, how they're coping. Um, and, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, our CEO would send out a, a recorded message, a voice message to, to our entire workforce every morning. Um, and, and it actually had nothing to do with COVID. It was an inspirational message. And what we've heard from our staff that for some of them, that message that they knew that they would, that they would look forward to it every morning would help them get through this pandemic. So I, I guess, you know, there's all the obvious things that you want to, you want to communicate and create communication channels for. But I think this year has shown us that the human dimension is just as important to keep in mind in our community, in communication um, planning. I, I love uh, just even the tactical advice of sort of the voice message. There's such a connection with voice. And so I think that's even, um, is that something that you all plan on doing beyond um, the moment that we're in right now with the pandemic? Or are you all still continuing that? I wouldn't have thought so when it started, right? But it, the, the response has been so overwhelmingly positive that um, it will continue in some, in some form. That's great, that's great. And definitely a takeaway for those of you in the audience communication and looking for very um, different and more personal ways of communication. I, I will definitely take that and uh, we'll be stealing that idea. That's, that, that's great. Um, and, and now on to maybe even some of the, we're not through this pandemic yet, right? So we know even in New York, as of this morning, live as we're speaking, that some of the uh, first vaccinations are being provided of uh, COVID as we speak. Um, and so that brings to mind safety. Um, as we're navigating, and this question actually comes from um, Darlene Kennard, as we're navigating this transition moment, very different than March and April and May, um, how are you all envisioning and talking about safety for caregivers? Especially you mentioned, David, that you know, folks were, were scared when we knew absolutely or almost nothing at the very start of this pandemic. How has that changed? How are you all thinking about safety? And, and David, I'll, I'll, I'll put that over to you and then Susan would love for you to answer that. Yeah, it's a great question. I think we, we are in a very different place than we were in March and April, not just because uh, of the vaccine has started to be rolled out, but um, because we, we now have you know, PPE in our inventory. We now have um, the logistical and distribution infrastructure to get PPE into the hands of our workforce. In March and April, you know, we had to basically overnight create a, a, a distribution mechanism to get these PPE into the hands of, of, our, of our caregivers. We now sort of have that machine built. And I would, I would say, um, you know, universal precautions, right? We, 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 have, we have honed our PPE protocols, which PPE level to use for which uh, categories of patients in which situations over the course of the year and are pretty confident in them. And and so I think the, that's the, the, one of the key pillars in our, in our safety protocols is, um, uh, is, is, is basically, you know, following those universal precautions and then, um, and then uh, taking the PPE up a notch in certain situations. Um, we are constantly revisiting, um, revisiting that to make sure it still makes sense um, and communicating any changes, uh, any changes to our staff. Um, I can talk about vaccination a little later on, but um, but I think when, when it comes to safety, it's, co it's continuing to communicate the, our three pillars of safety, which is our PPE protocols, our screening, daily screening of, of patients and uh, upon, for every visit and our staff, um, and then uh, robust contact tracing in cases where either patients or staff test positive. 
Thanks, David. Susan, how are you all thinking about, about safety? Sure. So I would echo what David said um, in terms of the beginning when COVID hit. Um, it was really, really challenging to the home care sector that um, PPE was kind of not on the distribution list for our home care workers. Um, and so it, it was a struggle. And um, I would say that um, we really work very closely with our state associations um, and who also work with New York City to try to acquire PPE um, on home care's behalf. And that was effective in the beginning. Um, then we were fortunate um, to work with our union um, who also helped facilitate with the city, work with the city to um, procure PPE. And they were wonderful. They did actually did drop-offs to each of the agencies and did check-ins to see how much PPE we needed, how much they could get their hands on. So that was a tremendous help. Um, I would say that, you know, we really identified in the very beginning when it was a struggle, we looked at our high risk cases, we really identified um, the aides that were on the higher hours that would go through more PPE, we really took a look at uh, distribution. Um, I would say we, we really did a lot of um, Wow, uh, like on the grounds efforts. Our one of our departments put together PPE kits, and for all of those aides that were working on um, high risk, for example, live in cases, um, we had a van that dropped off PPE outside of the patient's home and coordinated so our aides could get that and really feel our support. Um, so we did a lot of drop offs. We we had <laughs> our what was once a storage room became a room for PPE, and so um, we did a lot of training with. With our aides. In the beginning, we were training through social distancing, but we got creative. And um, one of the, I guess, opportunities that came out of this is that our aides were able to use a mobile platform, a mobile app that uh, we partnered with a company where our aides have a mobile app and we're able to send out data information, education, uh, educational materials on the most up-to-date requirements through that app. Um, as I said earlier, we also created a support hotline for nurses, um, with nurses, so that our aides could, um, and, and anybody in our industry, including admin staff, could make phone calls and feel like there was ongoing support in terms of safety um, questions and, and concerns. Um, and the other thing that is, is interesting, we created, um, so like, like David's organization, like VNS, um, we partnered with a company to do a daily screening, safety screening for all of our aides prior to going to their shift that asks, of course, the uh, questions that were um, came out through the CDC um, to and that that based on the, that response, it would send alerts to a live dashboard that was manned by nurses so that we could address the aides concerns and ensure that if there was a chance of them being positive, we were not having them go to the, the patient case. So we just, we, we implemented a, a lot of things and we continue to implement things. Um, currently, I'm happy to say like David, uh, there's more PPE available for frontline home care workers. Um, so right now we are working on ensuring that we have a 60 day stockpile for our, our workers um, and Again, we continue to work with our union and state associations. So I think that we, we've come a long way from the beginning of COVID until now. That's amazing. And so what I'm hearing is a mix of creating processes and rapidly deploying processes just to make sure on a day-to-day, -day, almost hour-to-hour -hour basis that you have protections across um, everyone, all your stakeholders, um, with temperature checks, um, doing a level of high reporting, um, but then I also hear a lot of innovation between both your organizations, whether it's implementing, you know, applications um, and, and having apps that did some of the, you know, reporting and monitoring, uh, as well as process innovation in terms of deploying these kits. Um, that, that's, that's really cool. And I, and I think that there's so much room there for folks to think about, you know, how do we make room for you know, leveraging technology, things that are off the shelf, and then creating process innovation and really scaling that? I think that that's, those are phenomenal lessons. Um, 
just a, a question even, and this is a, I, I think a format of, of, of what Judith, Judith Strange and Judith, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your last name. Um, I, I think information and gathering information and finding sort of answers to questions is something that I, at the very top of the pandemic you both alluded to, we all struggled with. Where are the sources of communication now that we are, you know, eight or nine months through this, um, where, where are you all finding information? Are there organizations that you would point to who've been really helpful in terms of your planning for this year and then going into next year? Are there, are there folks you, you all wanna give a shout out to either federally or nationally and, and locally? Well, I would say, you know, in, in New York, we've had a lot of um, really helpful communication uh, from our state and city uh, authorities. And so I would say that, you know, uh, in New York, you know, that's, that's the, that in addition to obviously the, the you know, the CDC, I would say that, um, you know, our, our, our Governor Cuomo with his once daily um, COVID uh, press briefings now down to three times a week um, and uh, communication from our city department of health. I think those have been our, our, our main sources of, of, of information, um, you know, uh, related, related to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And 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 our and then you know our associations, our state and federal associations have been um, very helpful in in supporting advocacy, um, you know, th throughout the pandemic, and also uh, kind of packaging and, and distilling uh, updates and information um, as it as it comes out. That's great, Susan. Do you have anything to add to that? No, no. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with David a hundred percent. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. So it sounds like you know, CDC and then uh, folks who are local leaders as well as um, your association. So a really big plug for joining the state associations as well uh, within your respective states. I love that. Um, let's go on to another a question. And this is something that we've alluded to a um, little bit, but, you know, uh, David, you mentioned earlier, uh, just even in terms of the pipeline building and the, and, and, uh, the resource of, of, of staff, right? So uh, Desiree Mance asks, you know, more so than pre-COVID, caregivers seem to be the ones sort of, you know, in the driver's seats. Um, what are your predictions moving forward in a COVID world to best recruit and retain quality caregivers, you know, when there's so much demand um, what are you all, or how are you all thinking about bringing in recruiting, onboarding and retention quality direct care workers, especially having gone through this very pivotal moment? Yeah, I, I can, I can take a first shot at that. I mean, sure. I, I think, um, you know, a, apart from the, the obvious kind of traditional techniques and, and tactics of you know, of, of sourcing candidates and, and recruiting and, and training them. I think that, I think that, um, you know, to be an employer of choice in your region, I think that's what we all strive to be is to be an employer of choice. I think you, you have to be an organization that's sort of easy to work with, right? Um, so sometimes that takes just a lot of blocking and tackling on the process front to, to make think processes faster so that when someone comes in the door that, you know, you're, you're able to onboard them quickly, right? Um, uh, and um, and so you want the experience of working for your for your agency to be to be an easy one, um, and and so so I think there's there's processes involved there, but also there's the, the human element and the the I can't I can't overestimate the importance of that supervisor or manager level staff, right? That's the, that's the face of your organization to your, to our, to your caregivers. And it's, it, if it, 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 you need to have a trusting, um, positive relationship and communication between the, the frontline supervisors and the, and our, you know, frontline caregivers for, you know, for, for that, for those caregivers to feel like, um, uh, you know, they, it's, you know, they want to stay with you know, your organization. So, um, you know, I, you know, I think there's there's compensation, there's there's training opportunities, and 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 all kinds of other levers we have you have. But I think make sure that you, I, I think you know, we're doing this ourselves. We're putting up a mirror up against ourselves and and asking what is the experience like of working for us, and where can we remove um, pain points, 
how can we be easier to work with? And how do we empower our frontline managers to be supportive and, and nurturing of, of our caregivers? David, I, I really, two things that I want to pull out, right? Because I'm, I'm, and by the way, everyone, I'm a teacher by background. So I love a lot of the repeating and sort of pulling out lessons. Um, two things that I really want to pull out for our audience is that sometimes process management, especially if you're a small home care agency, you've just gotten started, it's just looking at your low hanging fruit. Um, so really looking at managing processes. Are you doing this as best and as fast as you can? Um, and how are people experiencing your agency? So not only those processes, but your people. So having managers and training managers to be really supportive of your staff. I thought that was excellent. So chef's kiss on that and just really highlight. And, and Susan, what would, what would you like to add to that? Um, so I think that uh, one of the biggest, well, I don't wanna say threats to our industry or challenges is probably a better word. Um, is hiring an adequate amount of qualified workforce. You know, there's definitely a shortage that I, I can imagine most people, most agencies around the country are feeling right now. And uh, the need is going to, you know, continue to grow with the baby boomers. Um, and so hiring and attracting caregivers uh, is an ongoing is an ongoing challenge. Um, I agree with what David said. Um, I think that compensation, obviously medical benefits and all of those things are very very important uh, factors in, in competing with other organizations. Um, it's interesting, we, we are an organization that invests quite highly in, in education. Um, we invest in um, a lot of specialty training for our home health aides to meet the needs and, and our personal care to meet the kind of the, be on the forefront and meet the needs of, of the patients that we service. Um, we do a lot, a lot of disease specific training. So we've always done that. And I think that that's always attracted home health aides offering that kind of specialty training. Um, we were always very proud because we do train and we train ourselves, you know, home health aides and, and personal care aides and our program exceeds our state mandates. But what I'll tell you is there's a fine line, I think that we've learned between exceeding and investing in education where it shouldn't become, as David said, kind of burdensome. You know, mm -hmm. you want to make it easy for someone to apply. Um, you don't want to go, you want, you want to, um, I think, create the, a quality program, but without hurting yourself, where someone's going to come in and say, hey, I could go down the street and, you know, and apply and be done in a day. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for agencies. And I think we learned that lesson as well, where we scaled back. We were always so proud. We exceeded everything. And then we said, wait a minute. We may be losing people in the process um, because we were so vested and, and we're going, are we going overboard? And so we re-looked at our, our uh, recruitment and our training program so that we were able to kind of address the quality that we want, but not make it a deterrent for people to come on board to our agency. So I think just um, that understanding that fine line, as David said, I think is important being easy to work with is really important. And of course, the supervisors, the frontline people that work with the aides are so important. If you don't have continuity of care with your staff in-house and those individuals that work with the aides in the field, since that's the lifeline to most of them, you may lose people and, and that hurts. So I think that you know, working on your internal retention as well and continuity of care is important in, as well in terms of not only hiring people, but keeping people in your organization. That's excellent and a really valuable double click on that. And so even in the interest of, uh, and, and we, we've already started touching up on it. Um, so Steve Clute asks, what is the greatest struggle in home healthcare today and how do we fix it? So I've already, you know, I, I, I love what you've already addressed in terms of um, staffing, right? And personnel, Susan. Are there other aspects of home health that we should be looking at as an industry um, that are really things that are, you know, are, are upfront even for 2021 or in a post-pandemic world? What are, what are you all thinking about? What are your organizations thinking about? Um, and, and David, maybe you want to take that question first. Yeah, sure. Um, great question. Uh, so, you know, I think that. Um, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we see is 
I mean, work on every day is, is sort of siloing off of and thinking about home care as um, this ancillary mm -hmm. commodity off to the side and, and not kind of front and center um, in, in, the, in you know, our ability to bend the, the, the cost curve um, and improve quality, right? Like we have, uh, you know, the, there's a big disconnect um, between the fact that uh, our caregivers or, you know, in some cases our, you know, nurses uh, uh, caring for patients, they are, they're the closest to these individuals. They're closer than the physician. They're closer than um, basically any other healthcare uh, stakeholder. But, um, but they're all, it's often, home care is often sort of from a reimbursement standpoint and um, in terms of um, inclusion and value-based arrangements is sort of um, kind of off to the side. And so we're always looking for ways to uh, tie the, the work that we do to the value that, that we provide. And um, I think over the next you know, several years, that's the journey that, um, that's the journey that we need to continue on. So um, you know, transforming personal care delivered in the home from something that's measured in hours to, um, to you know, being rewarded for, for the outcomes um, that, that you're able to produce. And you know, an example is in New York State, um, our um, long-term uh, care program, our Medicaid funded long-term care program, you know, over the past few years has developed a, a quality incentive um, uh, uh, program that really puts, puts real dollars at stake on improving specific quality outcomes. And that's allowed the home care industry to kind of shine um, and for agencies to differentiate themselves if they're able to move the needle on those quality indicators. And I think that, um, you know, I think we hope to see more of that and, and hope to really, you know, transform how, uh, how we're seen. That's, that's excellent. And I, it's a challenge and then also an opportunity in that. Um, Susan, what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, well, I think that there continues to be, a, I, again, as I said, I think that the, the greatest challenge has been um, having an adequate amount of uh, the workforce, the shortage kind of in the industry, um, which was compounded with COVID, certainly fear of travel, child care, um, having adequate PPE. Um, and, but I think that as, as David said, and I'll talk to that a little bit because he and I, you know, we have that relationship, for example, when we talk about value-based care with VNS, um, I think it looking ahead at opportunities uh, in 2021, when we look at various integrated models and incentive programs based on value-based care, I look at, we look at as an organization, um, how we can utilize our workforce. Um, are there opportunities to advance our workforce? For example, you know, we've got home health aides and personal care aides, but within their scope of practice, what could we do to heighten their value in the industry to meet certain measures, outcome measures for patient care? Um, we have as a result of kind of valued based care when that came about and, and, and incentives, which we could actually, um, we could benefit from. Uh, we created various types of valued based training programs for our home health aides. Some were disease specific, um, but basically these were training programs that really centered on what these aides could do in the home to make a difference with their patients to achieve certain outcomes. Um, and uh, we worked with what we worked with our union, we worked with certain um, programs in our state. There were certain funded programs that um, allowed us to do some additional training with our aides. Um, and we were able to um, use a mobile app as well, where we've kind of digressed into a mobile app that allows our home health aides to capture outcomes and report patient outcomes to us real time so that our nurses, nurses could get that data and we can do something about it and react to that data timely. So again, I think there's been challenges and I think we're gonna to continue to see some ongoing challenges in 2021. But I think we have to look at our partners and what, what is needed in the community and, and where home care is going and really look at the opportunities with our workforce and how we can maximize those opportunities. That's a, a really great 
place a double click, right? So it's a capacity and capacity building within um, the direct care workforce. Um, Dana Krotz asked a question earlier in terms of, you know, private pay rates higher for COVID clients and then also training. Um, are you all as an organization or, or within both organizations, is that something that you all are looking into um, incentivizing and, and, and sort of building the pipeline of folks who are working with uh, potentially COVID patients in the home and, and, and are you thinking around ways of incentivizing certain training around disease states or, or things like that? What are your, and, and each of you or either one of you can take that up. Well, I can start. Um, we, you know, I, I think our approach to um, incentives when it relates to COVID, uh, COVID care, um, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've taken the, um, the, uh, the approach that um, sort of much like we use universal precautions in, um, you know, in, 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 in ensuring safety, um, you know, we, the visiting our service of New York has never has never sort of we don't we, we don't turn people away because of, of, of their condition and we sort of treat all all of our patients whether they're COVID positive or not um, equally um, and especially you know once we were able to to protect our, our staff and, and our patients so um, we you know uh, uh, so you know in order to support that that kind of philosophy, um, you know, we 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 haven't differentiated incentives um, based on uh, you know uh, based on the the, the the patient profile. Yeah, so I'll just I'll, I'll piggyback on that. Um, you know, there. Uh, so in, in in New York State, and and particularly, I'm speaking from a licensed home care agency perspective. Um, it's very difficult, although um, I think you know so many caregivers are deserving of incentives. It's very difficult to provide incentives in the way of compensation because um, our partners there there's limited. We we don't receive as a licensed agency additional um, reimbursement from our contracts when we have COVID positive patients. So it's very hard. I mean, I'm sure you know we we all work on very. Um, we don't, we don't work on large margins. And so it's very, very difficult to offer, again, across the board, you know, we're gonna give X dollars to um, aides or caregivers that are working with COVID positive patients. I think we, you know, in other ways, like creating a hotline and support systems, um, we have, I ha will say we have done some bonuses, <laughs> but uh, uh, by hand delivering PPE equipment and things like that, and just trying to create, um, support is really what we've done across the board, you know, with all of our aides. Um, there has been some government funding, there's some hazard pay and things like that. And, and if we've been lucky enough to get certain um, funding, um, you know, certainly uh, that has been passed on or utilized for the purposes of, of, the, of our workers and our caregivers. But um, we did not set, just like David, we we're not able, unfortunately, to kind of set that differentiation and that distinction. Absolutely, and thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for your questions. Um, and so uh, there, just to see if everyone is on their toes out there in the audience, there's a really great question that, that came up about process. So our guests earlier shared that, you know, it is about taking a lot of the friction points out of your processes. And someone asked, um, you know, what is your time from application to start? Um, I'll give maybe Susan and David, if you have any you know, thoughts or, or, or knowledge around that in your organizations, that's great. But out there in the audience, um, you know, I we would love you to get your thoughts about ways in which you are removing friction. This is a, I, I love process and this is something we're always talking about in our webinars, but the first step in making sure that you are really wrapping your arms around recruitment and retention is looking at your process. So what ways are you all reducing the friction within your application processes to start. Um, I know there are, there, there, there are a lot of people out there, um, a lot of leaders out there. So if you want to share any of those, we'll share them out with the audience as well. So we'd love to tap into your collective knowledge. Um, and we'll go into another question while we're, we're getting um, some thoughts on that. Do, do you all want to share or do you guys know those numbers off the top of your head? 
I don't know. Enough. I don't know. Okay. Enough stuff yeah. I can. Okay. I can. I can. That's okay. So, um, in terms of recruitment, um, mm -hmm. what used to take maybe uh, could take as much as eight days to recruit one individual is now taking maybe four. So we've really reduced. It. Now we when we recruit. Um, our company does our own, we're certified to uh, license to do our own home health aid and personal care training program. So having someone come in and recruit who has no prior home care experience or a certificate is very different than when someone comes from another agency with a certificate. That we're able to turn around quite quickly, but there are um, certain regulations, you know, with the Department of Health and things that we have to um, have to perform and, and we have to wait sometimes for some of the, those results. And those include uh, criminal background uh, checks. We do drug testing here in New York. Um, you know, of course, you've got to get reference checking. We have physicals and so forth. Um, all of that is still done in person. What I'm really kind of excited about um, is that throughout this pandemic, we learned to do our orientation and our in-services before the home health aides go to work on Zoom. We are super, we were able to set it up during Zoom, you know, for Zoom, um, we're working with um, new individuals and our existing caregivers on um, innovative ways to use technology devices, whether it's an iPad, a computer, um, or their mobile phone. So um, that's been a very, very big initiative at our organization. And I think that that's expedited the onboarding process. Um, we are currently looking at various companies who do online onboarding. Uh, we're not there yet, but we are, you know, vetting different and looking at different companies now for that on on board online onboarding, which I hopefully will expedite the process as well. That's great and, and super helpful too. Um, let's see if we've got any uh, responses to that. Um, and so now that a couple of people just have asked, um, just in terms of mobile apps, and we'll complete. We want to be helpful to you all, so. Um, do you have any shout outs or uh, in terms of the mobile apps that you all have used or uh, technology? Susan, do you have the, the, the name or the name? name? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we use for, for our aids, we're using the, um, to, so to screen the aids, and we use a couple of different apps for different reasons, but to um, screen our aids for COVID, we use uh, the Care Connect app. It's called Care Connect, that's the name of the company, it's New York based. Um, and that's how we um, screen the aids every day. They have a great platform. They also have a messaging system, which has been really useful. I think I spoke earlier about sending out um, any, any messages or data or educational materials to, to our aids. That can also be done through the Care Connect mobile app. It's free app that the aids download on their, um, on their phones. Um, Interestingly enough, we also, um, which is something that's new to our company, but we did start it prior to COVID. It's just become more helpful and useful through COVID, uh, through the COVID pandemic. We use the Care Connect. They have a special app that allows us to um, put cases, uh, you know, any open patient cases that we have, it allows them to go kind of out to the universe in a HIPAA compliant way um, to the aides to assign, to get assignments. So one of the ways that you retain workforce, right, is by ensuring that they have the work that they need. And that's challenging sometimes because sometimes the caregivers slip through the cracks. We don't know, our, we don't always keep track of our availability, but this app is phenomenal because it tracks our caregivers who are looking for work who are not working and we're able to put out our open assignments on a daily basis and have aides reply, our caregivers reply on the app. So that's also the Care Connect app. I feel like I'm doing an infomercial for Care Connect. I know, I know. You know, I already, I, I was just typing a note to our team. I was like, oh, we've got to figure out what yes, Care Connect is. Yes. That's, that's we're, great. We're also, we're also using them um, for e-learning for our in-service education for our workers. So we're not asking them to come in since September, we've not been asking them to come in to get their annual in-service. Um, we are using an online in-service platform. Um, and that's also through Care Connect, although we are exploring other, other options, um, but yeah, it's been really, really good. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and so uh, another question, you mentioned it earlier, David, um, regarding the vaccine. Um, and so 
uh, a lot of folks really want to know sort of how, how are your organizations thinking about vaccinating employees? Um, there's been several questions within different settings around uh, you know, caregivers and management staff, should you require vaccination? Are you allowing exceptions? So how are you all thinking about that, David? It's a great question, and it's um, it's how I'm spending a lot of my time uh, these days over the past few weeks. It's uh, we brought together our COVID emergency team. We brought the band back together to to start ramping up of planning for for the for the vaccine. And actually, it's a, it's a good reason to bring an emergency response team back together. So um, you know, we were very pleased to see home care um, uh, specific workers specifically called out um, as part of uh, phase one A of the rollout as as um, as, as frontline healthcare workers um, in New York State. So, you know, vaccine distribution is happening at the state level in New York State. Uh, we'll work with both New York State and New York City. Um, we, are, we are ramping up um, as we speak to, uh, to vaccinate our staff. Um, so we, uh, we, we anticipate not receiving the Pfizer vaccine because the Pfizer vaccine has, uh, you know, the storage requirements um, are, are difficult for, for an organization that's not a, you know, a, a large uh, hospital. Um, but the Moderna vaccine, while it does need to, in long-term conditions, needs need to be deep, deep frozen, once it's thawed, it has a shelf life of 30 days. So within those 30 days, you know, we, we feel confident we'd be able to use it. So um, assuming the Moderna vaccine gets uh, approved later this month, um, we are we are ramping up to uh, to receive doses. We don't know how many, and and initiate a vaccination of our staff. We're going through the process of prioritizing within our workforce which are the roles at highest risk of exposure. So just like hospitals are prioritizing first emergency room staff and ICU staff, we are sort of doing the equivalent um, in our staff. So uh, going through that process uh, now. Um, and standing up a whole um, vaccination operation. And it, in some ways it's not new to us, right? We, we administer flu vaccines to our uh, staff every year, but in other ways, this is uh, you know, fairly unprecedented in terms of the uh, thousands of, of vaccines that we will, um, we will need to administer over the next several months. We're, we're building a scheduling system that will create um, a simple scheduling system that will create uh, appointments that will allow us to schedule appointments for, uh, for of folks to come um, get vaccinated uh, and and tracking right there's a lot of reporting requirements and you have to track sort of you know when someone gets that first dose when should they when they should be scheduled for that for the second dose in the case of Moderna and then if all goes well over the course of the first half of the year um, other vaccines will get approved and um, and we will you know we will be able to work with those as well the other thing that we're beginning to plan for is in-home vaccination for for the homebound vulnerable po uh, you know uh, uh, populations, um, you know we're starting with with staff because that's the that's kind of the CDC's prioritization. But we know that on the heels of that um, will be uh, uh, you know an effort to get vaccines out to the most vulnerable, and um, and so that's a that's going to be a logistical undertaking, um, and uh, uh, you know we are uh, we're, we're planning around that, but. Um, it's exciting, right? It's hard work, but it's, it's like you can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and I will just add one more thing, which is that, um, you know, education is critical. So mm -hmm. we just held our first town hall, all employee call this morning, where we had our panel of, of physician experts answering questions about, mm -hmm. about the vaccine um, and, and dispelling myths in some cases and, and really explaining in ways that all of our, our, our staff can, can easily digest, um, you know, uh, uh, whether these vaccines are safe, what, uh, the, the, what the clinical trials, um, the process of the clinical trials followed, um, and really, you know, encouraging our staff to, um, you know, to, to get vaccinated. We are not requiring, we are not requiring vaccination. We are not making it mandatory um, at this point. So education and the standing up an operation to make it available. That's, that's great. And, and Susan, can you tell us how, how you all are thinking about the vaccination process? Sure. Um, so I think that uh, David and his organi organization are further along because they, they've done this type of, they've done testing and, and um, you know, flu vaccines in the past where we have not on site. Um, however, we are looking at um, 
we are re- we actually have already registered on the city's website to administer the vaccines. We think it's important for uh, our healthcare uh, workers to um, be able to access the vaccines. Mm-hmm. I think that access is something that has um, been a barrier to a lot of our our caregivers in terms of just being tested for COVID over the past ten months. So I think we want to. Uh, just create access for those caregivers who want to have the the essential workers who are able and who want to have the vaccine. Um, We also would not require the vaccine. We think it's a choice. I'm not so sure that the Department of Health or our state may not mandate it down the road, just like Mm -hmm. they did for facilities. Uh, You know, again, not sure that that won't happen, but I do believe it's a choice. Um, We will also look at this, I think, and organize it in a way um, where we identify our high risk patients. So looking at caregivers who want it by, again, by the patients that are are high risk. Um, So we're not as far along, but but our intention is to um, administer the vaccine. We've also done outreach to um, a wonderful medical practice in our area. Um, and we're discussing the idea of, uh, we work very closely with nurse practitioners, our organization to do a lot of preventative. We're starting this whole preventative care program and um, we may be utilizing nurse practitioners to also administer Mm -hmm. um, the vaccine to um, our partners if if they want our contracts for patients in the home. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so we're we're thinking along all different lines right now. We're organizing how we would, how we would do this and and implement it. It just points out to the fact that you both are operational masters, right, in your domain. And what I'm hearing is it's about accessibility. It's also thinking about prioritization. And it comes back to that same refrain of communication, um, you know, and and communicating the value of the vaccine, even if you're not mandating it, um, and what that means and, and making sure it's pretty plain stated within your organizations. We are on our last minute and I could talk with you both forever and write a book with you both, Um, but I will sort of create a shorthand of maybe all of the remaining questions and, you know, we, this moment is this moment and then we are right now shifting to another new normal based on sort of vaccination. What are you all looking forward to? Is we're only a couple weeks away from it, which is hard to believe. What are you looking forward to in 2021? You know, based on the lessons of 2020, what is what is what is making you hopeful, whether it's you know professionally or even personally? Well, um, you know, professionally, I'm looking. For, I think we're looking forward to uh, really taking advantage of this leap um, that's happened during COVID around uh, virtual uh, virtual care, right? Um, mm-hmm. And taking advantage of opportunities to provide uh, care in different ways using different um, different you know technology platforms. And I think the other thing we're looking forward to is is a kind of the front and center role that home care has played as an alternative to insti- you know to care in, in facilities and institutions. And so um, you know I think we we have a tremendous opportunity to um, to cr- to develop and and create products and, and suites of services that allow more people to stay at home, um, kind of, you know, living independently. And so I think that's very exciting. Yeah. And um, I agree with David. Um, I think that, um, you know, out of every adverse situation comes right opportunities. There's always a silver lining. At least that's the way I like to look at, at things <laughs> in life. Um, I really appreciate the relationships and the partnerships um, that we maintained and the support with our partners like VNS, kind of the deepening those, re- I look forward in 2021 to kind of deepening those relationships and how we could work even close, you know, closer together um, with various innovations and opportunities. Um, we are also um, really, I'm really looking forward to um, Technology in 2021, the continual evolution and rapid changes we're going to see with technology, continual uh, virtual visits, um, our agency, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, we're going to be working very, very um, diligently on preventative care in the home and working with nurse practitioners and our home health care workers on kind of upskilling what we can do to um, change outcomes in 2021. 
I also think an area for 2021 that we should all be thinking about, especially with like Medicare Advantage and other plans coming into place, are some of the non-medical aspects of home care and um, looking at social determinants of health, um, food, transportation, um, socialization, and things that uh, kind of those other things beside clinical care that keep patients home out of the hospital um, and thinking of ways that we could utilize our caregivers to address the social determinants of health. I think that's a very big area for 2021. I think you have provided, both of you provided some, 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 a lot of really great opportunities to look forward to, no matter the size of the agency out there. I want to thank you both. I think this is phenomenal. A lot of things I'm running back to our team with in terms of learning just from you all. Um, thank you so much, everyone out there for joining us on what is the last views from the C-suite of 2020. Um, you all have been phenomenal. I thank you all of our partners and all of our uh, respective stakeholders for, for joining us on these webinars from the very start of the pandemic to even now. And I wish you all, Susan, David, thank you so much. And I wish you happy holidays. Thank you very much thank for joining you. us today. Thank you. Stay healthy and well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.